I am honored to introduce John Barry, Dr. Charity Dean, and Philip Zellico to all of you. John Barry is an award-winning author of six books, two of which have involved him in policymaking. His articles have appeared in such scientific journals as Nature and Journal of Infectious Disease, as well as the New York Times and the Washington Post. And he has been a guest on every broadcast network in the United States, appearing on such shows as NBC's Meet the Press and the PBS's The News Hour. Dr. Charity Dean is the CEO, founder, and chairman of the Public Health Company, a venture backed Silicon Valley technology startup that envisions a commercial grade global biosecurity platform to empower enterprises to manage bio risk at scale. Prior to that, Dr. Dean served as the Assistant Director for the California Department of Public Health, uh, where she was part of the executive team under Governor Newsom running the COVID-19 pandemic response. Philip Zellico is the former Executive Director of the 9-11 Commission and the Carter Ford Commission on Federal Election Reform and the White Burkett Miller Professor of History at the University of Virginia. He has written several works of nonfiction, including The Road Less Traveled, The Secret Battle to End the Great War. Tonight, they will talk about the book Lessons from the COVID War, written collectively by the COVID Crisis Group, a group in which all three were a part of. The book delves into both the successes and failures of the American response to the COVID-19 pandemic and seeks to use the experience gathered from the period to better prepare ourselves for the next pandemic. The Washington Post calls the book a sob sobering, realistic assessment, one of the most important to come out of the pandemic. The nation should pay heed to it. So everyone, let us all welcome John Barry, Dr. Charity Dean, and Philip Zellico. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm the director of the COVID crisis group, so I'll just open up this conversation that we'll have. We'll talk among ourselves in front of you for about 35 or 40 minutes, then open the floor to questions. I think the first thing I ought to do is explain what is the COVID crisis group. Um, well, we weren't originally the COVID crisis group. Uh, we actually were get, came together about two years ago when a group of foundations um, thought, well, of course, there's going to be a national COVID commission that will study the pandemic, try to develop lessons learned, um, do an exhaustive investigation. And these foundations asked me what would be involved in preparing the way for such a commission, because I'd done this sort of thing before. And I kind of explained, and they said, well, why don't you organize a planning group to get all this ready? And so I did, and I began recruiting uh, basically the best people we could find in America. Then I and others began conducting, I think about, we interviewed, we did listening sessions with about 300 people of all walks, and uh, working in every part of the country, including people working overseas. We formed task forces, we commissioned research, and so on. And then it became clear there wasn't going to be a national COVID commission. There are lots of reasons for that. But um, that became pretty clear to us by about uh, the spring, summer of last year. And we had a kind of a choice. There were at that point 34 of us. And uh, you can see from the back of the book, and uh, there are the three of us. Uh, there's a fourth member of our group here tonight, Monique Mansura. Um, uh, it's uh, my myself accepted, it's a really strong group. Um, it's a, I think for people who follow these subjects, it's, it's a good group that represents all the major disciplines and backgrounds uh, you'd want involved. And we basically had this choice. So we, at this point, thought we really understood what had happened. There wasn't going to be a commission. We could just kind of hang it up and shrug our shoulders and just say, well, that's Washington for you. Or we could... Um, write our own report. And actually, we held town meetings among members of the group. Uh, and Monique's nodding her head. She remembers this. And the members of the group are really strident. Like, no, we actually don't wish to go off into that good night. And we would like to write this report. And so we did. And so that's, therefore, the book you have and the reception to it has been gratifying. 
Um, so this, that's, that's why we're here. That's what this book is. Um, we wrote it in a very direct, plain spoken way. We don't dumb it down. But on the other hand, uh, we wrote it in a way that any person without a medical, it's not written like a Lancet article. Um, it's, it's written in a, uh, in a direct way that anyone can understand if they'll step up to it. Um, and it covers everything from origins to warp speed. And so there are many subjects uh, uh, summarized and addressed in, in this report. And, you know, a lot of people ask me sort of what's the big takeaway from this report because they're, you know, they're busy. <laughs> and like, well, because like, what's the one takeaway from this? And so I say, okay, uh, the big, the one takeaway is uh, be prepared. Preparedness. So what do you exactly mean by preparedness? Well, that's what this book is. And actually, preparedness is it's just worth kind of thinking about that word for an extra minute. Preparedness really is, um, I know what to do, and I'm ready to do it. I'm trained to do it. I have the tools to do it. You know, we have the people and institutions to do it. We have the authority to do it. But above all, you start with, I know what to do. Note, notice the difference between uh, the kind of I, how to do it versus what we should do. See, everyone can immediately agree, well, we ought to make everybody well. We ought to, you know, we should, uh, you know, A, B, C, D, E. Yeah, but how do you do that? And what do you exactly have to do to do that? And if you're not prepared when the crisis hits, you're too late. So what happened during the war is we, were too, we weren't prepared. Um, in many ways, ranging from the sentinel surveillance to spot the outbreak overseas, all the way through the story, including even in some many respects today in the deployment guidance on how to use Paxlovid to treat people with COVID. And by the way, most people who get COVID don't get properly treated with the drugs that are already available for it, um, and so on. So, you can go through all that and you can hit that theme of preparedness, and we do. But actually the story is full of how people improvised during the crisis. And actually a lot of, a lot of Americans improvised brilliantly, sometimes courageously, and actually illustrate lots of lessons like, here's what to do. Uh, I remember a few weeks ago talking to Charity here about the report, you know, some, we had just talked to some reporters who have, People, reporters who've covered this crisis are very downbeat. Um, they've been around Washington a long time. They can't be very cynical and hopeless. And it's like, why do you think your report can possibly make any difference? And so I would mention to them, because she didn't, hasn't heard this, is I would say, well, actually, I was talking to Charity Dean about this just a couple of weeks ago. And she said that actually when she read the report, she found it empowering. And the reason she found it empowering, the reason I think any reader of the port find it, would find it empowering, is as you go through it, you think, oh, we can do this. This is uh, There's just low-hanging fruit all over the place. And actually, the criticism, you know, in a way, it's not that, oh, the government already knows exactly what to do, and they're just bad because they're not doing it. No, they haven't done this report. They haven't read it yet. They have not done, there's not an internal after-action report. That's the equivalent of this. So in other words, if people will work through this, uh, it is impossible to read this report and not, and not be changed by it at all levels of government. You'll just immediately start seeing things uh, that can readily be done, many of them without a giant act of Congress, without new technology, with tweaks on existing authorities. Uh, it's really just an illustration like, here's what you'll need to do in a giant emergency which may be a pandemic, but may be something else. So with that kind of introduction, I want to transition now to, to, to John Barry. Uh, John um, wrote the authoritative book on the last great pandemic to sweep America more than 100 years ago. Uh, he wrote kind of the book on the influenza pandemic of 1918-19. And um, so John's had a chance to kind of step back and compare uh, the American system we had then with the American system we had confronting this pandemic. And I want to give 
John a chance to comment on that. Oh, I, uh, John wants me to also pay a, no, no, I'm, I'm glad to mention President Trump. So, uh, cause he, he's so right. It's that whenever we appear, actually both, both parties, uh, have a good blame narrative for the crisis or it's good for them. Uh, the Republican blame narrative is blame China or blame bad public health authorities for whom the poster child is Tony Fauci. Okay. So that's their blame narrative. The Democratic blame narrative is blame Trump. Um, and uh, in the report, right at the start, we say, uh, well, Trump, let's just get this right out of the way. Trump was a comorbidity. What is a, co you all know probably now what a comorbidity is. It's a pre-existing condition that increases your risk of death or serious illness. But the level and extent of unpreparedness went way beyond President Trump and antedated President Trump. Um, it's not, you know, there are lots of things that happened in this crisis that were President Trump's fault. There are a lot of things that happened that weren't. The report you'll find, uh, wherever, wherever we need to describe Trump's role, we describe it pretty flatly. And no reader of this report will finish it thinking that they want Donald Trump to be anywhere near the instruments of government any ever again. So it's, you cannot read this report and not come away with that view. But um, if you think that that's the end of the story and now that we he's gone, we're ready for the next pandemic, then that's a big mistake. John? So uh, to me, that's the biggest take takeaway is that the system failed and area after area, the system failed. Uh, if you look from the outside in advance of this, it didn't look nearly as bad as it seemed. Uh, as Charity said, it sort of had some, some curb appeal from the outside. You know, there was an incident manager and so forth at CDC, and they activated that process immediately in, you know, the 3rd or 4th of January as soon as they found out out really anything was going on it may even have been before the third of january i can't remember the exact date but it was very early <clears throat> but you know as philip was said it's how you do something it's it's not the idea it's the engineering or as a football coach would say well you got to execute uh you know you had the plans there was no execution uh and in many places there there weren't really plans that went beyond nominalism. Uh, an example that I've heard Philip talk about, and it's a very good example, is testing. And there's something that did not rise to Trump's level when that failed, but even if they had designed a test, pro test properly, uh, the idea of manufacturing it, I mean, one of the main points of the book is, is, is hooking up with the private sector in advance as several other countries do so that you have a capacity to to scale up rapidly um, but there was no real strategy as to how to use test about the only thing that was thought out in advance in terms of how to actually execute there had been a lot of thought that went into priorities of vaccination but in terms of ex actual execution of a plan uh, that's about it, as far as I know. So um, one consequence of a 19th century system confronting a uh, 21st century pandemic is then some people were going to have to shoulder the burden of all of that. And actually, charity was one of those people. Uh, I think this may be a, this a line from you or a line from our mutual friend in Santa Clara County is that it felt as the federal crisis management collapsed in April and May of 2020. And this particular person commented that it, it felt like a boulder was rolling downhill right at us. And Charity was at the bottom of that hill. She had been a county health director and then was helping to run the California public health system right at the epicenter of the crisis. Sure, um, are we on? Uh, I can just share some anecdotes of what that was like, but I think all of it 
is for the whole point of taking an honest look at a self-evaluation from how the United States of America did. And that's why it's so important to us, to all 34 of us, that we approach this not with any political viewpoint, not looking to indict either the former or the current administration. Really, I, I personally, I'll speak for myself, have one goal. What solutions do the, does the United States of America need to provide for the common defense and be prepared for all numbers of threats, including pathogens, um, and including different kinds of pathogens. As a local health officer, I had served, essentially, my job was risk manager for Santa Barbara County for many years. Uh, the title is public health officer, and it seemed quite an antiquated role. Many people would say to me, that's so odd. What, what do you do? Uh, we've eradicated tuberculosis. No, we haven't. I manage those cases every day. And so I knew working within this antiquated system that when I needed to deal with an outbreak that was in West Virginia and Santa Barbara, what did I do? I sent fax machines or mailed snail mail reports with old fashioned stamps. Sometimes I'd get on the phone. Nothing involved electronic transmission. So any one of us working within that system as a local health officer, especially in California, because we uh, are really independent, the local health officers have unique authority, knew this system was not designed for the kind of fast moving pathogens that we see today. We saw the system fail in 2014. Remember the Disneyland measles outbreak? Uh, that should have been a fairly straightforward containment if we'd had the situational awareness in the digital technology and real-time data. We didn't have that. Our data systems are not connected across healthcare and public health. And so when COVID started, to be honest, I felt like a crazy person. Um, I felt like a crazy person trying to explain to anyone who would listen, this is a mathematical certainty. Here's what's about to happen. Here's how it's going to roll out. Let me explain exponential growth. I myself had a hard time wrapping my brain around it. So I think it's important for me, having served at, you know, being a public servant at the local level and then at the state level and coordinating behind the scenes with many heroic public servants in the Trump White House trying to do the right thing, that we not blame the humans. Humans did their best. Sometimes they were in tough positions and they didn't have the tools that they needed. But the system's failure, that's what gives me hope. It sounds funny that this book would give me hope. It does, because this was a system's failure. And there's a number of low-hanging fruit opportunities where we can actually prepare a system that has early warning, early response, shared visibility, coordination across healthcare and public health, modernize some of the data, sure. But even without any technology solutions, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. And that's really what we focus on. Yeah, uh, some of the, um, I, I was in a conversation a couple of days ago for a podcast with Mark Lipsitch. No, excuse me, with Josh Sharfstein, um, who uh, helped run public health in Baltimore and then Maryland, and now uh, teaches and is a dean at Johns Hopkins. And um, Josh, who actually helped us in a lot of our work early on, was asking me, um, well, is, is the public health system to blame? Did they fail? And uh, like, where, where, where do you stand on that? And the way I answered that question, it's a very interesting question because this was a system that went into the crisis set up to fail. So you set the system up to fail and then you blame it for its failure. Now, within the system, uh, you'll find a whole range of people, some of whom were outstandingly competent, some of whom were not. Because actually the people who lead the system are selected more or less according to the way they would have been selected in the 1890s. They're often patronage political appointments and uh, sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not. What they all had in common during this crisis is they were almost all overwhelmed and then we had to invent ad hoc improvisations of governance involving lots of things in order to uh, um, make this work better. Um, John, you were, uh, it must have been a, a remarkable experience for you during 2020, sort of watching, you know, watching this unfold as someone who had been the chronicler of the last pandemic and just seeing the way the system with all the fancy technology we didn't have in 1918 
nonetheless floundering and flailing? Well, the single message that I think, or the single lesson that came out of 1918 uh, was to tell the truth. And, you know, I've written five afterwards to that book. And it, all five have the same last page. Everything else changed. Uh, and in the planning stages, every state has a preparedness plan for a pandemic. And the federal government has one. And very high priority in all those plans is exactly that. They use the word transparency, which I don't like very much. But, uh, you know, you don't tell it, manage the truth, you tell the truth and so forth. Uh, obviously, that didn't happen. You know, what we needed in this pandemic was not just a whole of government response in which the systems we're all talking about failed, but we needed a whole of country response. And the only way you get that is through good, good communications. That was the same in 1918 as we had this time around. Total chaos, uh, a lot of misinformation, some, and a lot of outright lies. The reasons for it were completely different. Uh, in 1918, of course, we were at war. This were involved in political campaigns. Uh, but the results were, were very much the same. And I guess I'll cut off there so that you all have more chance to talk. Charity? Charity? Sure, I'll say a few words about that just because the, the system, I'm so passionate about the public, U.S. public health system and the history of it is really important. And what you said is critical. You know, here we are 100 years later with all the technology at our fingertips. We've got social media platforms that communicate information in real time. And yet the misinformation that was spread during COVID was a massive problem on par with what we've seen in past pandemics. How is that possible? Um, I again would look at the systems problem and back to the question that, that Josh asked, did the US public health system fail? Um, it indeed was set up for failure, but that's something that we can fix. We headed into this pandemic without the tools, without the real-time information that we could have had in 2020. So digging into that from 34 different perspectives from the authors, I came away with hope because the system that we have today absolutely can be modernized and there's easy things we can do. It's funny, I, I always say in conducting this analysis, I will not blame the people, but you wanna know what the truth is? I'll never get over it for myself. The public servants that led, it was devastating to have trained your whole life to do one thing and then to fail. Not for lack of effort, but for lack of a system. So it's important to me that in doing the analysis and writing this report, we look at the system, but I just want everyone to understand that local health officers, I could name heroes in California, Sarah Cody in Santa Clara County, uh, Bela Matias in Solano. Um, we will never get over this failure and we are willing to do what it takes to build something new. So let me um, try to clarify a little bit of what we mean by system. Um, John, or for example, referred just to the testing mess and that even if we'd had 10 million tests, we actually didn't really have a plan for what to do with the tests you kind of think about it for a minute, uh, all the different claims like, hmm, do you use the test to have biomedical surveillance so we can track the progress of the pandemic? Uh, do you use the test to provide point of care protections in places like nursing homes? Do you use the tests, especially once we had rapid antigen tests, in order to help reopen schools or protect essential workers? Or do we use the test to open 10,000 drive-through test sites around America so anxious citizens can find out if they're sick? So, right? So all these competing claims and demands for lots and lots of tests, each of which have to then have protocols for how the test should be used in that environment, paired to the labs that can give you really rapid through processing of the test results, paired with FDA approvals that will clear the way for the use of the tests in that specific context, and then the financing to back that up. So I'm using this illustration simply to kind of clarify, here's what we mean by preparedness. 
So even if we had had the 10 million tests in the warehouse, you, that's, that's only step one. Um, flying blind, what Charity was talking flying blind with, with no toolkits, which is the dilemmas she's facing. So all through the report, we talk about biomedical surveillance. We, didn't, we couldn't track the progress of the virus. To this day, actually, we're not very good at tracking the progress of the virus with adequate genomic surveillance. Uh, China has better gene sequencing capability in local hospitals than we do. Um, data issues. We have superb quality electronic health records in the private medical care and health care system, especially in places that use what are called longitudinal care plans. So, but those electronic health records are not at all connected to the public health system. Um, and actually, it's hard to connect them because of there's all sorts of proprietary and privacy issues, and often the local health departments are the regulators of those hospitals. But we actually come up with some ideas uh, without new technology of here's how you could put some uh, nonprofit intermediaries in the system as we already do, for instance, so that private companies can share information about aviation safety in that industry. Um, so you, you don't need new technology. You don't need a giant bill. You need lash ups that can allow you to connect the superb data capabilities in much of the private system with a public health system that has none. And they're just, they're just example after example of, of things like that because, and then here as the crisis fades, as panic uh, gives way to neglect, I think our common fear is that people will just think, well, this was just some natural disaster and there's nothing you can do about it and let's hope it doesn't happen again. John? Well, again, I, going back to the data, how important that is. I mean, we were making decisions here based on data that are being gathered in the UK, in Israel, in South Africa, in Qatar. Uh, and that data was important, uh, probably the most important medical treatment that came out of this pa pandemic was relatively early dexamethasone, a dirt cheap steroid. It was enormously helpful and that was just the United Kingdom analyzing data. They didn't do any massive trials so much. They just saw the data come in from people trying everything. Uh, and they came to a conclusion. And it's probably the, the single most important advance. And actually, uh, dexamethasone was used to treat President Trump when he came down with a quite severe case of COVID in the fall of 2020. Uh, dexamethasone and monoclonal antibodies that were still going through clinical trials. And so then he pops out of the hospital feeling great and rips off his mask. Um, Charity, you've been uh, also very close to these issues of data. And in fact, you're trying to work on some of these issues of how we um, track uh, emerging dangers. What, what's your thought a little bit as to how we should think about um, the uh, the, these sorts of dangers in the future is the um, can we breathe a sigh of relief that we're about to declare the end of this emergency next week? I don't think so. Um, here's where I think we are and where we're headed. Um, as devastating as COVID was, the truth is there are much worse pathogens out there, both naturally occurring spillover from nature and the kind that can be manufactured. And when the next one happens, it will not matter where it came from. What will matter is two things. The two things we failed at this time, how fast can we number one, contain it and number two, characterize it, trap it and study it. That's the goal of public health right there. Trap it and study it. What we failed at this time around has gold mine lessons for next time. I believe far worse threats are coming. Uh, we know a few things. The world has changed with the amount of uh, mobility and cross pollination and deforestation and a lot of the ways we're using the earth has increased the frequency of these kinds of events happening with pathogens. It will not be another hundred years. So we have an opportunity right now to say, how do we get better and prepare for the next one? Which I believe we will see in my lifetime 
Um, we never repeat the same outbreak from the past. Every time it's something a little bit different. So the kind of tools that we need are really threat agnostic, meaning the ability to prepare for uh, you know, Ebola or smallpox or fill in the blank pathogen that's a mixture from, from the others that we've seen in the past. If I were to describe the kind of capabilities, what data needs to be able to do, not just in the US, but in the world, is rapidly characterize and contain a novel pathogen, fast moving, that it pops up simultaneously across 20 different entrance ports. If we have the kind of quick data systems and coordinated operational response and testing is a great example. Um, uh, I was one of two that was asked by the governor to stand up a testing task force, make something out of nothing. How do we fix this? We took a hard look at the testing systems. The ability to contain and characterize a fast moving pathogen, um, that's, that's the kind of system that we can build today. Integrating data systems, boy, is that a puzzle especially in the US. And we look at countries that did really well. And I think it's a, it's a valuable topic we cover in depth in the book. Who did well and why? One of them was the UK. Their ability to use data uh, to track the outcomes of new variants, characterize them very quickly, inform the world, how does this new variant of concern behave? We've got sequencing and healthcare data. They have a very robust system and they, they perform very well in that regard. And there's lessons that the United States should learn. So, um, oh, go ahead, John. I was just going to second what Charity said. This was not the big one. You know, the 1918 grant, forget about H5N1 with its 40% case fatality rate, which would go down if it ever did adapt to mammals. But, uh, you know, 1918, if you correct for a uh, population, would have killed today the equivalent of you know, 200 to 400 million people. Uh, and even if you factor in the best case of medical care, you would cut that down significantly, but you'd still talk about a best case of probably 50 million to 75 million deaths today if you didn't run out of all sorts of supplies. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, something that we need to concern, we need to improve ourselves on. Frankly, I think right now we're less prepared uh, than we were in 2019 uh, because of the divisiveness of the country. Uh, something's got to change. So um, one of the, uh, again, one of the heartening lessons of the crisis that, that people, well, what about warp speed? These developments of miracle vaccines. That was a success story. I think our report has the best account now available in print of the origins of Operation Warp Speed and what worked about it and what didn't work about it. Um, it's really important to understand that Operation Warp Speed did not mainly succeed as an R&D program. I mean, we're, we're not that far from the NIH here on High Wisconsin, but <laughs> so I hope I'm not offending any NIH people out there. But the NIH had done great work on the mRNA platform, on coronaviruses, Operation Warp Speed, uh, Pfizer, by the way, didn't participate in the R&D part of Operation Warp Speed. What, where Warp Speed scored its biggest points was in manufacturing and distribution. And that's a kind of an illustration of what we mean by preparedness. If, uh, what we want is, in, in Charity's hypothetical is we detect the emergence of this pathogen and we have already prototyped the capabilities to manufacture at scale across a number of different families of pathogens. This is, the crisis helped show that this is a doable capability to acquire. And the crisis also showed another thing that various economists said, this is one of those rare cases where literally if you spend billions of dollars, you save trillions of dollars. Those, that, those numbers actually proved out in the COVID pandemic. America alone spent $5 trillion as a result of the pandemic. That's trillion. Um, so this is a case actually where we've discovered that our technology can give us these fantastic countermeasures, but a lot of the game in preparedness is not just to have some science, it's actually have the operational capability to deploy the science in time to save people. So what I'd like to do now is um, 
open the floor a little bit and give some of you a chance to ask some, ask some questions. Um, Okay, um, I'm an attorney and a physician. Um, do you consider in your report that the best plan in the world will not work if the people managing it uh, don't believe in government? They believe the government is a problem, not a solution to a problem. And do you talk about, for instance, we had tools to protect people, agencies to protect them. The, the tool is called the Occupation Health and Safety Administration, the Occupation Health and Safety Health Act, and it is enforced by the Occupational Health and Safety Administration. And that the things that were needed to protect people were not rocket science or vaccines, they were personal protective equipment. And ASHA had the authority to order companies to get this stuff on an emergency basis. And just in case nobody noticed, there were thousands of complaints filed with ASHA about nurses wearing garbage bags and nursing homes whose uh, people had no protection so that they were spreading the virus from one nursing home resident to another. Uh, so it wasn't like nobody knew, and it wasn't like the authority wasn't there. No one did anything except, uh, oh, what's his name? The president's son-in-law who called his friends to see if they could manufacture some uh, pr personal protective equipment. They did not use the authority that the government has to order stuff in an emergency that they usually use for defense, and so they're quite familiar with it. Do you talk about that? Actually, we, we do talk about, uh, about that. There were people in HHS mm -hmm. who had the authority, actually, and who began thinking about ordering massive numbers of N95 masks mm -hmm. in January mm -hmm. of 2020, and actually were in touch with the leading manufacturers of these masks at 3M and Prestige mm -hmm. Ameritech, mm -hmm. and the CEOs of those companies were reaching out and we mm -hmm. talk about what, and there were actually billions of dollars that could have been released mm -hmm. that the government didn't understand was available because it wasn't in HHS, it was in DHS, and you needed to invoke Stafford Act authorities, which they didn't do until the middle of March in order to release the billions of dollars. I mean, this is, uh, these are unglamorous details. Mm -hmm. There's a whole separate story, which uh, we discuss about kind of the cavern between the public health authorities and the occupational health world. Um, the points you make are very good ones, both for OSHA and, but also for the National Institute of Occupational Safety and right. Health, which is part of the CDC complex. And actually one of the problems in that gulf, and part of it had to do with the political leadership in Washington, mm -hmm. but there were other places where these N95s could have been mass produced mm -hmm. if OSHA let down on the job. But one of the examples of those gaps actually lies in the public health community. Um, it, the people who first realized that aerosol spread was the key to the way the disease spread right. were docs working in occupational who were experienced with aerosol in occupational health. The public health docs um, didn't pay much attention to the science from the occupational health docs who didn't work at their universities or um, it was a different academic community and a different academic culture. And uh, there's been some pretty good postmortems done on why did the uh, public health doctors, both at the CDC and their friends at WHO, get the aerosol spread issues so wrong. And it actually, it's an insular academic culture that really missed these calls, even though much of the world who weren't so closeted were seeing these. So some of this was a problem in political leadership. Some of it was in the Department of Labor but also there were parts of this problem that you can see more broadly. Okay, but these were things, this, this, this didn't require a plan. This was stuff that was there and ready and everybody knew it. Meat packing plants were required, should have been required. The authority is there. I'm an attorney, I read the statute. The authority is there to require the meat packers to provide masks 
and gowns and spacing. This is not, you know, this is not something that we, did, we didn't know about or we didn't plan for. That's why the law was written. They just refused to do it because the meat packers would have lost money. Well, and if a few meat the, packers died, eh. okay. There's a you know the, the larger part of your question is, and something that we all thought about is, is it a systems failure, or is it a failure of individual leadership? Leadership. And in this case, while there were plenty, plenty, thousands of heroes all over the country, uh, both some of them failed, now dead. Both failed. Next question, please. <laughs> yes, there, there's a line. And thank you for your passion. Hi, uh, thanks so much for that talk. That's really interesting. And I wanted to ask more about the international element of this um, with regard to this question of inevitability. Um, even if the U.S. had done all the uh, preparedness measures that you advocate for in the report, um, if other countries did not come along with those, um, do you think that really would have um, been enough to help us in such an interconnected world um, to the sort of extent of warding things off? Um, and yeah, just like how much can the U.S. do just alone by ourselves? Well, let me start by saying I think there may have been some disagreement in among the 34 people as to whether or not this was possibly been contained more or less at the, at the source. I personally don't think it could have been, nor do I think that any such outbreak or a spillover can be contained. I mean, about 15 years ago, uh, Alan Cypress, a Washington Post foreign correspondent, wrote a book about Indonesia with the possibility of an H5. He went down into the actual details, what it would take to contain an H5 outbreak. It wasn't pretty. I personally don't think it's possible. But what the book does address, and what I think would be the unanimous, is without a doubt a unanimous opinion of the 34 collaborators. You know, we have 1.1 million deaths, more than that. Could we have done better? Could we have cut that in less than half? Yeah. Maybe way, way less than half if we had done a really good job. So we discussed the international side in several ways. Um, there is a whole international side to the outbreak and the detection of the outbreak. So we spent some time on that and the international efforts, because the international system we had to get warning of an outbreak decisively failed. So we need a different vision and we offer one. Then there's a whole set of issues where you can compare the American institutions with institutions in other affluent countries and, and which have very different institutional designs and we did not do well by those comparisons and we have some data on that. But then we also talk about the global response. We talk about the global vaccine efforts, the global countermeasures efforts, which included, by the way, some heroic improvisations. We invented a thing called COVAX that did not exist at the beginning of 2020. We invent, it was invented in the spring of 2020 and that was an international organization that ended up dispensing more than 2 billion doses of vaccines to people all over the world, saving countless lives. As, and a lot of what were, it was too late, it was too little, and there we get into this in the report, but there are a lot of lessons for how to do better next time, because the key thing is, as John was pointing out, this is gonna be a global war. To wage a global war, you need a global strategy, and it needs to be organized by a global coalition. And there are only a handful of countries that are gonna make or break whether that coalition works. Wait, can, Thank I, you. can I add one more thing? Cause I think you just asked the important question. I think about that all the time. Um, contain, was, was containment possible and what about the global response? Even if we did everything right in the United States, so what? Um, so I studied microbiology undergrad and became obsessed with the diseases and how they would manifest. And my, my question was always, what is the earliest sign that it declares itself? You know, then it's Tulane, studied tropical medicine. It was the hemorrhagic diseases that always caught my attention because they declare themselves. The perfect pathogen has a component of asymptomatic spread. 
Why? Because it doesn't declare itself. It spreads silently in the population. So I think that the unique challenge of COVID globally, even if everyone had done everything right, is that component of asymptomatic spread meant that we were going to have to use testing to make it declare itself in a way that we haven't had to use for other pathogens in the past, you know, Ebola example. So this was a uniquely challenging pathogen. I'm grateful for some of those challenges because they've pushed me as I look at what are the digital technology software intelligence solutions to understand that we have to be prepared for pathogens globally that have that component of asymptomatic spread and have strategies testing to make them declare themselves when the symptoms do not. Thank you. My name is Lydia Riley. I'm a member of the Citizens COVID Origin Inquiry. We've been active for about three years here, studying it in depth. Um, I pulled together a timeline called a U.S. Bio U.S. Bioweapon Development and COVID-19. And in the process of pulling from many sources that timeline, which is on our website, covidorigins.org, um, I ran into constantly the practice of gain of function which was a surprise to me. I couldn't believe my eyes when I read about it, uh, which is a process by which dangerous pathogens are manipulated in laboratories genetically or otherwise to make them more dangerous and more transmissible. And uh, that is a sign of a bioweapon. Another sign of a bioweapon is if a pathogen is aerosolized, as anthrax was, for example, in, uh, in, as part of the 9-11 attack. Um, so uh, my question to you is, I'm sure with all the study you've done too, uh, you, you know about gain of function. <laughs> so my question is, uh, for what possible purpose, other than making a bioweapon, um, for what, and we, and we know also that that the United States has been involved in this, uh, Ralph Barrick, down in North Carolina, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, was involved in it. The researcher Xi with the Wuhan lab, who was in charge at the time of, of uh, COVID outbreak uh, of the lab in Wuhan, China, had been working under with Dr. Barrick to learn those techniques that he had been doing since 2005 of, of gain of function and doing it in a way where it could not be detected that a virus had been worked on. Um, she had actually been with him in, and he had also, they'd been studying these bats on which they did this manipulation in Wuhan and she had been working with him in North Carolina. She was actually there. The United States was funding that, that lab uh, through the National Institute of Health. And um, my question is, uh, can you can you address gain of function? What possible purpose could it have, and can it be stopped? Can we make it uh, so it's illegal? We have a 1989 U.S. Anti Bioweapon Act on the books, passed by both houses of Congress. And what can we do to enforce that and not do gain of function anymore? So um, we have a whole chapter on on these issues. And, uh, and the scientists we have are not people who are polemicists on either side of this controversy and are deeply informed. And that chapter is a very carefully written chapter. Um, and we interviewed a lot of people about this. So what you'll find is, a I think, a very a reliable discussion of the origins controversy that does not come down hard on either side because we think actually the evidence is just not there yet to come down hard on either side. And we explain the best arguments on each side and what evidence is still missing. Then we make two big recommendations for the future, one of which is right on point for your question. The first recommendation is we need a much better system of global surveillance of outbreaks that's much more concerned with the human crossover point and not necessarily with scouring jungles and bat caves, to, um, as one person put it, uh, looking for a needle in a haystack armed with a torch. Um, the, so that's one of the, but the other is we say we need a, a major new international effort 
to work on biosecurity and biosafety, that we're entering frontiers of bio, biological engineering. And by the way, some of our scientists have been in, somewhat controversially involved in urging more regulation of biological research now for more than 10 years, like Mark Lipsitch and David Relman, who are somewhat who have attracted, though they're at Harvard and Stanford respectively, have attracted some controversy for their calls on this. Um, we, are at, we are doing frontier research that is worrisome, and it requires a level of scrutiny. There is a version of this controversy going on right now in AI. Now, to your question, like, is there any good from any of this work? Yes. Um, to, for example, the reason people were supporting this research is to identify pathogens with pandemic potential. They were conducting experiments to see, well, gee, how easily could this mutate into something that was incredibly transmissible? And so they would try to conduct those mutations in a laboratory to find out if this was a really dangerous pathogen. Um, but that's an extremely dangerous form of research. So then you would argue, how, do you ban that research? Can you ban it? Do you regulate it? If so, how? We discuss this. Another example is um, when you get into the details of exactly what people do with recombinant DNA, which is what some of this is, that's actually where we get our major vaccines. A lot of the vaccine R&D, like smallpox vaccine, is kind of developed through a form of recombinant DNA to change, the fun to change functions and see if then we can get a vac vaccine. So a lot of the research that people need to do to develop vaccines for new pathogens involves some of this work. But in saying that in defense of a, some really important biological research programs, I want to stress that our report comes down, and it's somewhat controversial in some circles, comes down very hard in saying we need more regulation, more global regulation in this burgeoning field of science. We have time for two more questions, and let's just make sure we keep them nice and concise so they can they have the time to actually answer the questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, you mentioned uh, misinformation. Uh, would you include in the category of misinformation when Pfizer was doing its trials? There was a young twelve-year-old girl, Maddie McGarry, Maddie DeGarry, who immediately uh, was paralyzed from the waist down uh, after. Uh, in, uh, after she received the vaccine, and Pfizer reported that uh, as an ab abdominal pain, uh, and that's the way it was uh, reported. Uh, also, in terms of the vaccine, uh, the the, pre the president, uh, all public officials, even a Supreme Court justice, mentioned that the uh, vaccine would prevent uh, transmission. Uh, a Pfizer vice president said it was never tested for uh, the transmission, uh, the, to prevent transmission. Uh, and then also it would, uh, the vaccine uh, would not, uh, you would not catch the virus. Uh, that's proven to be uh, uh, not correct. Uh, would you include those items in misinformation? I'm happy to answer that from my perspective and really what we had looked at as a group. Um, I would summarize the challenge with misinformation, and I, I believe this is true for both sides of, of an issue. Let's just say, is the vaccine safe? As trust in the transparency of the information that's shared. That includes, you know, vaccine side effects that may have been found, um, any aberrant cases or uh, poor outcomes as, re, you know, as part of a study. Um, it also includes being honest with parents. For example, I spoke with many, many parents that were scared about vaccinating their kids and they wanted to know what is the risk of vaccinating versus not vaccinating. The point you raise about the vaccine the vaccine's ability to prevent death and hospitalization versus its ability to prevent transmission is an important point. I've had many of those conversations with people, especially parents of kids that were going to school because schools needed to be reopened. They wanted to send their kids back to school and they were wanting to vaccinate their kids. And so their question was, um, the risk of vaccinating my child, let's say my teenage son, um, the risk of a poor outcome from the vaccination versus the life-saving benefit, prevention of hospitalization, prevention of death, um, understanding that their child may still get infected. 
they are vaccinated, so it may prevent hospitalization and death by an order of magnitude greater than a risk of an adverse outcome from the vaccine. And, and this is where the transparency part comes in, where I think we could have done better at communication. There will still be cases spread in schools, even among kids that are vaccinated, but they're not going to get they're much less likely to be hospitalized and to die. And so this is what in public health, we, you know, we talk about this with vaccines, you know, risk reduction, decreasing the order of magnitude risk of hospitalization and death. Those kinds of transparent conversations, that's the kind of communication we need. I'll just share my approach when, when dealing with um, someone that has vaccine hesitancy. I start with common ground. I say, look, everyone loves their kids. You love your kids. I love my kids. Everyone's trying to do the best thing for their kids. So people come at this asking the right questions with pure motives, wanting to do the right thing. That's the common ground. We start from there. Then answering the scientific questions after that, that comes out easily. Um, it doesn't always mean that people make the same decision to vaccinate, but it keeps the conversation open. It keeps the door open. And I think that's what was missing this time. We became so divisive because some information, people felt like it wasn't shared widely. Um, people felt like they, they didn't understand uh, pre preventing transmissibility versus preventing hospitalization and death. So I think it's a good point that you raise and I think we can do better. Well, and the other thing is when the vaccine first entered the public domain, it was having you know over 90% effectiveness. And there was the belief that with that level, it was, and it probably was also, was. Uh, limiting, trans preventing transmission. But the virus changed. Mm -hmm. The virus mutated and you know gained the ability to evade the uh, vaccine to the effect that it could be transmitted, and yet it, the vaccine is still, it's not perfect, but it's awfully, awfully good at preventing uh, death. Uh, so that was a change in the virus. It wasn't that anybody was telling you a lie. Mm -hmm. Next question. Well, last, last question. Mr. Zalico, you mentioned your funders and uh, Eric Schmidt organized the foundations. You didn't mention that Eric Schmidt through google.org was funding Metabiota, EcoHealth Alliance, Wuhan Institute of Virology, in, in virus hunting in Southern China, which you described as looking for a needle in a haystack with a torch. Um, this was initially funded through google.org. I'm sure you're aware of this. And it was funded by um, eBay as well, Jeffrey School, who is another one of the funders of your work, um, also funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. Your work is funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. Rajiv Shah was the director of USAID when this google.org project, Predict and Prevent, was moved to USAID and given hundreds of millions of dollars. Rajiv Shah, funding you through Rockefeller Foundation. And then the fourth funder of your, of your work is Koch. And Koch is the funder of the MIT scientist, Robert Langer, who worked with Moderna as instrumental in developing the mRNA technology. So I, I'd be very curious uh, about how they approached you with this project. And, and I did read your section in your book, and you do mention Shi Zheng Li. You mentioned the Mo, what I have known as the Mojiang miners hypothesis, where they're, you know, miners are in a cave, they come into contact with bat guano, they get sick and they end up in a hospital with a SARS-like virus. Um, so, so yeah, so when Eric Schmidt came to you, um, how did he, how did he um, explain to you his interest considering that he had funded virus hunting that may have caused this pandemic? Yeah, I, I've, I've seen this tweet um, and the people who are propagating it. I don't at all accept the factual premises of those people supporting those things. And you can film me saying that. Wait, sorry. So you're, um, are you saying that Google.org I, I don't, did not fund? No, I, am, I, I don't accept the premise that Google.org was funding research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Funding, funding the no. Prevent virus hunting of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. You, you can do the work, people can do the work on who funded those U.S. government programs, which were funded by USAID. Well, it started at but, Google.org, and I have the document right here. I'd love uh, for you to look at it if you're not aware of it already. Um, Here's the thing, it's like, these folks wanted a national COVID commission and didn't ask us to just get into anything having to do with these issues at all. 
Uh, they didn't get into any of the substance that they wanted us to find. But if you're concerned about our funders or you don't like these people or these funders, I have some good news for you. There's a sentence in the report at the back where we talk about our funders. And we say that our funders had nothing, nada, to do with the drafting of this report or any of its recommendations. Not one word. So there was no substantive guidance from them on what to say. And since I held the pen for that drafting, and all these folks saw draft after draft after draft, these 34 people stand behind this report. And uh, if you don't like what's in the report, you can hold them accountable because the foundations had nothing to do with what we said. And I think there were two paid staff people. Philip was not paid. Charity was not paid. No, we're I all was volunteers. not paid. The other 30, if, if some of the other 30 members were paid, I would like to know because I'm <laughs> on a check. We all participated voluntarily. We all have a deep conviction of writing this report together from every perspective, um, including people who had different political perspectives, you know, had served in different administrations, different areas of expertise. And we wrangled with each other and dug in to find the truth and, you know, met with hundreds of people. So this was truly a, a very independent report that was generated. I can attest to that as being one of the co-authors. Um, and I certainly wasn't compensated for it other than knowing that we produced something that I think gives real solutions for the United States. And that was worth doing. So 